dear students uh, today i am beginning a series of discussions on waiting for godo it will be most probably a series of 10 videos 10 lectures and in this very first video today i propose to talk about samuel beckett as a dramatist we will be looking at different critical dimensions of the play waiting for godo in the next few videos but let us today talk about samuel beckett as a dramatist dear friends when we think of samuel beckett as a dramatist the very first key word that comes to our mind is the word is the term iconoclast as a student of literature we are aware about this term being used with reference to shelley the great romantic poet has been looked as a great iconoclast of english literature similarly this term iconoclast or what we call the image breaker is a very appropriate term with reference to samuel beckett and his writings also beckett my dear friends in his writings shatters a lot of things of literature more especially of conventional drama he shatters the traditional conventional beliefs of drama the conventional traditional practices of drama and he also shatters a lot of conventional traditional faith and belief that we have with reference to a lot of things of our life so he can be truly seen as an iconoclast who has shattered the realms of conventional drama he has pioneered a new kind of theater which was beyond any kind of classification of traditional drama traditional comedy traditional tragedy etc dear friends uh, his plays were beyond any or above any kind of message they do not have any specific moral teaching or preaching kind of thing they do not have any kind of a specific message and they also are not seen as mere entertainment the plays of samuel beckett do not teach any lesson as i said earlier also they do not preach any sermon as i said earlier also and also that we cannot uh, see beckett as a propagandist and his plays as propaganda plays as such so the plays of beckett show a situation in which we all are and this is the very important concern of a beckett play the the a, a beckett play exposes us to a situation in which we all are in our real life also a beckett play exposes us to our own existential despair and to our predicament also being a reader of a beckett play or being an audience to a beckett play is neither seeking entertainment nor seeking any kind of time pass rather it ensures the total involvement of our personality because his plays are said to be as total theater and total life my dear students 
these two terminologies, these two phrases, total theater and total life, are very key components in the stand in the understanding of uh, Samuel Beckett as a dramatist. And I hereby assert you, I hereby request you to try to look at the meaning and to try to uh, implement this understanding of these two terms, total theater and total reference. So, sorry, total theater and total life with reference to the plays of Samuel Beckett. So, my dear friends, the plays of Beckett are a matter of immediate experience. As I said earlier, that they expose us to a situation in which we all are. So, so the, a Beckett play basically uh, refers to an immediate experience. These plays of Beckett are not for enjoyment, not for any kind of light entertainment. They actually produce an effect that is peculiar to the theatre. And what is this? An immediacy of something experienced directly as distinct from the more remote impact of something described. So, my dear friends, a Beckett play must be understood in totality and not in broken pieces, not in fragments. He uses words not only to convey ideas but also to produce effects. Like music, his plays must be heard to be effective. You know, as a student of literature, as a student of theater and drama, all of us know that uh, spectacle is the most important part of, of, of drama. A drama is meant to be produced and it is meant to be presented on the stage. But when we think about and when we refer to a play by Beckett, it is almost very important, it is always very important to listen to the plays of Beckett. So, because, because the voice is as effective as an orchestra. So, one single voice, however weak that voice may be, but that one single, even weak voice is as effective as an orchestra. And silences are very important in Beckett, in the, in the plays of Beckett. So, silences are as important as the sound. And sound is also as important as meaning. So having said this, let us now try to assess the effect or the impact or the appeal of the plays by Samuel Beckett. My dear students, the plays of Beckett challenge the assumptions of the audience. The plays of Beckett challenge the assumptions of all of us about life, about the world, etc. So, a Beckett play challenges our assumptions with regard to life and they almost like they stay in our bones. So, in the words of a critic, and I quote that critic here, they haunt me sleeping and walking, coming upon me when I am least aware, unquote. So, so, so this statement by the, this learned critic I repeat their statement once again, they haunt me sleeping and walking, coming upon me when I am least away. So this statement can tell you that how we feel a play by Samuel Beckett, right? It is as if, as if something is divinely ordained and it, 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 is, it, is, it is being bestowed upon us very slowly at a time when we are least aware about it. So instead of offering any tract, instead of offering any dogma, instead of talking about creeds and instead of talking about credos, instead of giving us the way outs and solutions and answers, instead of uh, highlighting any kind of philosophy, what Beckett simply does is that he communicates a life experience. He communicates with us 
his vision of desolation. Now look here, these two keywords are again very important, communicating the, the life experience and communicating the vision of Beckett's vision of desolation. So it has it, it is it is always useless to search for any kind of logic in a Beckett play. It is always useless to search for any kind of universal moral message in a Beckett play. So Be what, sim what, what, what Beckett does is that he simply presents an experience, not an argument. He talks about truth, not about statements. Listen, this is very important. The Beckett talks about truth, not about statements. Now, at this juncture, I would like to refer to two statements by two different learned critics. One learned critic says about waiting for Godot that it is a dramatic statement of the wretchedness of man without God. Now, this learned critic, where we can very well guess, must have been a religious uh, minded or so to say a, a Roman Catholic minded critic who is looking at waiting for Godot as a dramatic statement about the wretchedness of man without God. There is another critic, perhaps a very firm existentialist critic who looks at waiting for Godot as a general expression of the futility of human existence when man pins his hope on a force outside himself. Now look here, these two statements by these two critics, one a Roman Catholic critic and one an existentialist critic, they are at one time valid and invalid also. They are simultaneously relevant and irrelevant also. Beckett was never concerned with any religious or philosophical beliefs. That does not mean that Beckett had no idea about religion. That does not mean that Beckett had no understanding or no uh, no 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 uh, uh, belongingness to any kind of literary or political or philosophical belief or ideology. That does not mean. But but certainly when he is writing a play, for example, waiting for Godot here. So when he is writing, waiting for Godot, he is simply writing about waiting without being interested in any ideology, without being interested in any kind of system. That is an, another fact that when he was writing this play or any other play, uh, Beckett was certainly driven by the philosophy of existentialism also and he was also driven by the ideology of the theater of absurd also. Right, but he maintains a sort of a neutrality, and he is never concerned in his plays, at least, he is never concerned about any religious or philosophical belief. He was writing, as I said, with reference to waiting for Godot, he is simply writing about waiting without being interested in any system. So, he was just writing about in his plays whether it is waiting for Godot or any other play by Beckett. He was just writing about human helplessness. He was just writing about uh, frustration and all those different modernist aspects that came into uh, the discourse, the that came into the modernist discourse in the post-World War I and, and, and post-World War II scenario. Now, with this, let us now bring in into our discussion some uh, very pertinent and some very important characteristics of the plays by Beckett. For example, uh, Beckett, uh, in, in, with regard to Beckett and with regard to the plays of Beckett, we can say that his plays has his plays have no action and his plays have no uh, plot. Now, being trained in the traditional theory of drama, the, the Aristotelian concept of drama, the Greek, the classical aspect of drama and even also the Elizabethan aspect of drama. So being a student of all these things, we as a student of literature know how much plot is important, how much action is important in a play. Right. But when we look at these two aspects, I mean action and plot 
in a traditional sense, in the conventional sense of drama, we can very simply and very easily conclude that a Beckett play does not have uh, uh, any action and plot uh, with reference to the conventional concept of drama. So nothing happens in them. Nothing happens in the plays of Beckett. And by this, Beckett is perhaps signifying that nothing significant can happen in this world. So this lack of surface meaning, so apparently there is a lack of surface meaning. So this lack of surface meaning in the plays of Beckett reflect the meaninglessness of human existence. So if there is no meaning, if there is no, if there is a lack of surface meaning in the play of Beckett, it is because of his belief that, his belief in the meaninglessness of human existence. So the plays of Beckett have very little or no movement. Now once again as a student of literature and specifically as a student of drama, we know that movement is also a very important aspect of drama. So, but the plays of Beckett have very little or almost no movement. The play remains the same even at the end where it began. So, and the another thing is that uh, you, we also do not find character or characters in the traditional sense of drama in a Beckett play. So in several of his plays, there are no female characters even. And if there is, if there is a play in which Beckett is using a female character, he is not using her gender, he is not using her femininity for any purpose. Another thing is that his plays are independent of time. There is no reference to time. There is no reference to place. There is no reference to any specific time period and age in, in, in the plays of Beckett. Now, once again, as a student of traditional drama, we know that how much setting is important. And when we talk about, when we assess a play with reference to its setting, you know that we talk about the location of the play, the time period and the time frame of the play, etc, etc. So when we look at the plays of Beckett, they are independent of time, they are independent of place and they are independent of any specific period, any specific age. So with this, he creates an effect of timelessness. With this, he creates an effect of universality. Now talking about the hero in a Beckett play, we can once again reassert, we can once again say that there is no hero in a Beckett play in the traditional sense, in the traditional concept. So whether it is the Aristotelian concept of literary drama or tragedy, whether it is the Shakespearean concept of drama, hero or the tragic hero is certainly a very important aspect, a very important part. But a typical Beckett play does not have a hero in the traditional sense. Many of his plays, many of his plays have more than one character of equal length and importance. Yet we may identify the typical features of his characters. So there can be, there can be some typical features in his character or characters, but you cannot find a hero or a central character or a, or, or a chief protagonist sort of thing in a typical Beckett play. So it has generally been assumed, it has generally been presumed that such a character has some autobiographical elements. So yes, my dear friends, uh, the character or characters in the plays of Beckett has certain autobiographical elements. 
The next thing is that a Beckett character or characters of Beckett are rootless. And a Beckett hero, a typical Beckett hero is experienced but disillusioned of life. He is aware about the futility of life. He knows the meaninglessness and the purposelessness of life. And knowing fully well the futility of life, the purposeless and the meaningless of life, he lives the life courageously. So in spite of the fact that he knows the futility of life, he knows the meaninglessness and purposelessness of life, but in spite of this, a Beckett character or a Beckett hero or the characters in Beckett plays, they they try to live life courageously. The life may appear dull to them. The life may appear drab to them. The life may appear meaningless, purposeless, futile to them. But still, knowing fully well all these realities, the Beckett characters or the characters of Beckett live the life courageously. A typical Beckett character is not interested in poetic and utterances. He does not use very poetic kind of language in his dialogues and conversations and all. Uh, and a Beckett character expresses the meaning, expresses the import of his words in a very plain and direct and bare manner. He is deeply concerned about the problems of life and also the problems of time. So he is a Beckett hero or a Beckett character is visibly shattered. And why he is visibly shattered? Because of his failure to discover a meaning in life. So moving ahead, my dear friends, a Beckett hero has no illusions. And, and even if he has any illusion, if there is any illusion, he knows that they are mere illusions and that is why he does not allow the illusion to deceive him beyond any certain degree. So my dear friends, the characters of Beckett bring out his chief concerns and what are his chief concerns? I point out one, two, one or two. I point out here one or two chief concerns of Beckett through his plays. One is to portray the bleak human situation. On this barren, barren planet named as Earth. And the other is to puncture the shams and pretenses. So the characters of Beckett bring out Beckett's chief concern which is to portray, as I said earlier, the bleak human situation on this barren planet Earth and to puncture all shams and pretenses. So his characters are without any past. I said it earlier also. They are rootless. They don't have any past. Even they don't have any future. They are just present in the present means they are present only in the time when, in which the play exists, only in the time in which the play is running. So they exist only as long as the play exists. They exist only as long as the play lasts. So the characters are without any past, without any future, they are rootless. The tragedy, my dear friend, is that they are rootless, but they are unaware about this, that they are rootless. So Beckett does not give us any hint as to how they have come to this situation. I mean his characters. Beckett never tells us that his characters, how, how they have come to that specific situation that is being shown in that play. How they have come to that situation in which we find them as audience to a Beckett play. And another thing is that we meet them in the first few frames of the play 
and when when we depart from them in the last few frames of the play they remain the same so whatever and, and and in whatever way we find them in the first few frames of the play they remain unchanged in the last frames of the play till the end of the play now at this juncture my dear friend i would like to bring in uh, something about uh, the abstract drama and beckett friends i'll be talking about this in greater details in one very separate lecture in which we will try to look at the theater of absurd and we will also try to evaluate waiting for godo as a drama of absurd so there will be a separate lecture with regard to this but right now assessing samuel beckett as a dramatist i would like to very briefly bring in this concept of the absurd and my dear friends when we look at the plays of samuel beckett i hope you will agree with me that they have got the status of the classics of literature i hope you will also agree with me that with the passage of time the popularity of beckett and the acceptance of beckett's plays will grow they will seek more and more attention from the world or rather they will they will get more and more attention from the world so his plays are plays without actors his plays are plays without acts acts here also mean those the concept of act in the plays act 1 act 2 kind of thing and act also means here action so his plays are without actions without actor his his acts are acts without words and my dear friends beckett is regarded as an absurdist according to the concept of the absurd in albert kam so i i i hereby request you to look and to study albert kamus concept of the absurd and what albert kamu has to say about the absurd right so 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 kamu when he was trying to define this word absurd meant a life lived completely for its own sake in a universe which no longer made sense because there was no god to resolve the contradictions so this is what albert camus says with regard to the absurd and this is what i have said that we can look at samuel beckett beckett as an absurdist with reference to what albert camus thinks about the absurd albert camus through the term absurd means a life that was lived completely for its own sake number 1 in a universe which no longer made sense number 2 a universe which no longer made any sense that is number 2 because there was no god to resolve the contradictions this is number 3 now my dear friends you are aware all of us are aware this that the concept of no god or the concept of the death of god is a very important discourse in european philosophy and european literature right uh, i hope we are aware about nietzsche and what he said about the death of god etc etc so this concept of a universe which no longer makes any sense a, 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 a universe where god is no more there to resolve the solutions to give the solutions and to resolve the contradictions so in just in this type of universe we are lead to we are compelled to lead a life completely for its own sake so beckett's absurd is also closer to the concept of kierkegaard's despair i also uh, request you to try to understand what kierkegaard has said about the concept of despair friends the world of samuel beckett 
in which is a world in which Godo never comes. The world of Samuel Beckett is a world in which Mr. Not K N O double T, in which Mr. Not lives up to his name, Not. I hope you know that Beckett had written a novel with the same title, Mr. Not. So Beckett's world is a is is a world in which Godo never comes. Beckett's world is a world in which Mr. Not lives up to his name. Beckett's world is a world in which it is perfectly natural to pass one's time in a dustbin. It is perfectly natural to pass one's time up to the neck in sand or face down in, 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 in mud. Beckett's world is a world which seen from the Escal Room of Endgame. I hope you know Endgame is a very famous play by Samuel Beckett. So Beckett's world is a world in which seen from the Escal Room of Endgame is a devastated world, a post-atomic world and hence it is empty, empty and it is so much so empty my dear friends that even a solitary human being seems an interruption. The world is so empty that even the presence of a solitary human, human being is a monstrous intrusion. So Beckett summed up his own attitude towards the, uh, towards the absurd in 1949. And I quote that uh, statement here. The statement is, there is nothing to express, nothing with which to express, nothing from which to express, no power to express, no desire to express, together with no obligation to express. So my dear friends, this 1949 statement by Samuel Beckett can be can be a window for us to understand the Beckettian concept of absurdism, the Beckettian approach towards absurdism. And look at each and every part of this statement. Let me break it into parts and to tell you there is nothing to express, nothing with which to express, nothing from which to express, no power to express no desire to express, together no obligation to express. So, so this statement by Samuel Beckett is, is very helpful for us to understand Samuel Beckett's approach towards the theater of absurd. Right. Now, when you look at this statement, this very statement, there is nothing to express, kind of, so when you look at this statement, you will say that, sir, don't you think that Beckett was a pessimist? Yes, you are right, my dear friend. Beckett, to a very certain extent, was a pessimist. He can be seen as a pessimist. He can be seen with this angle of pessimism. But I personally believe that more than a pessimist, he can be seen with an angle of realism. So let us, for the next few sentences, let us for the next few minutes, look at uh, Beckett as a, as, a, as, a, as a pessimist and as a realist altogether. And this will be, this will take us to the close of our, to the end of our lecture. My dear friends, when we say that Beckett was a pessimist and when I say that Beckett was a, was a realist, let us look at it in some way. Beckett, my dear friend, is aware about man's solitude. Aren't we aware about our solitude? We are. You are also aware about your own solitude. I am also aware about my, my own solitude. So Beckett is a writer who is talking about this solitude of man, who is talking about this loneliness of man. 
Beckett is also aware about imprisonment and pain. Are we not aware about our imprisonment and way and pain? Don't you know that you are a prisoner here in this world? Right? So Beckett was aware about man's solitude, imprisonment and pain. He knows that this is an intolerable universe, a, a, a hostile universe, a very unfavorable universe. A world or a universe which is not at all helpful towards our existence. A world or a universe which is basically very intolerable and very unfavorable and very indifferent to our existence. The world is very indifferent to man's suffering. So I repeat that Beckett as a writer talks about these things because he is aware about man's solitude, imprisonment and pain. He knows that this is an intolerable universe. He knows that this universe, this intolerable universe is very much indifferent to the sufferings of man. So the world, my dear friend, the world about which Beckett is writing in his plays is a world which is without unity. It is a world which is without any kind of clarity. It is a world which is without any kind of rationality. And it is a world which is without any kind of hope. It is a world, my dear friends, where man feels himself alone. It is a world where man feels himself a stranger in a place which will one day cease to exist. You know? The place, the world, the universe in which we are a stranger and we are living alone and we also realize that one day this world itself, this place itself in which we are living alone as a stranger will cease to exist. So from this confrontation between the unreasonable silence of the universe and the human need to be, the human need to exist, there arises a futile revolt of, a futile revolt against existence. The painful rebellion of the spirit the painful rebellion of the spirit against three necessities. No, my dear friends, I do not mean the three necessities of uh, roti, kapda or makan, the clothes and the clothing, sorry, the, the, the bread and the clothing and the residence. No, I'm not talking about these three necessities. I'm talking about some other necessities. So, so, so the painful rebellion of a spirit against the three necessities. What are those three necessities? The abject necessity of being born, the hard necessity of being alive and the sharp necessity of time. So being born is an abject necessity. Nobody asks me that whether you want to take birth or not. Nobody asks you also that whether Mr. Sanchan said you want to take birth or not. So we are living with this abject necessity of being born. And once we are born, we are having to face the necessity, the hard necessity, the harsh necessity of being alive, remaining alive. We have to till the breath is coming and going, right? You have to remain alive and to make your efforts. You know that you are making an efforts which are useless and purposeless and meaningless and nothing. You know? But still you try to live courageously. So and the third is that the, the sharp necessity of dying. Nobody wants to die. But we know that it is a necessity and it is a sharp necessity of our life that one day we will cease to exist. And we will cease to exist in a universe which will also one day cease to exist. 
So all these aspects are constantly being discussed threadbare in the plays of Samuel Beckett. When we seriously analyze the issues discussed in the plays of Beckett, we may assert that Beckett prior prioritizes human importance. Yes, he is basically highlighting the impotency of man. So he prioritizes human importance. He strips his characters of all human equipments. I told you earlier also that his characters have no past, no future. His characters are useless. He's, sorry, his characters are rootless. So he strips his characters of all human equipment. He no property, no status, no physical strength, nothing is given to his characters. They are rootless and they don't know that they are rootless. They are purposeless and they don't they are least aware that they are purposeless. So he makes man aware how lonely he is in his place. Samuel Beckett makes us aware how homeless we are in this universe which has been very wrongly being called as the home of man. My dear friends, in waiting for Bodo, the two characters, the two trams, Vladimir and Estragon, have no home and they have no locale. And the tragedy is that they were unaware about this realization. So the major issues in the plays of Beckett are man's identity, number one, his limitations, number two, and his place in the universe, number three. These are three very major issues. These are three very major concerns in the plays of Samuel Beckett. Man's identity, his limitations, and his place in the universe. Now, at this juncture, I would like to bring in into our discussion a very brief reference to a very famous play by Samuel Beckett titled Happy Days. In Happy Days, we find a woman, Winnie. She is buried waist deep in sand. And, 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 and she is buried waist deep in a background that suggests the aftermath of an atomic holocaust. Her male companion Willy is barely visible behind a mound and their conversation which is mainly a monologue by, by, by Winnie is outrageously out of keeping uh, with their situation. So our familiar postures and our verbal habits, the standard poses of our human wisdom and consolation are all subjected to a very ruthless criticism, are all subjected to a very ruthless scrutiny in being adopted by uh, this half-buried woman winning. The contours of contemporary uh, discourse However pretentious or unpretentious that discourse may be, so the contours of contemporary discourse are employed in a situation of importance and total negation in which they bear the weight of sheer tragedy and comedy altogether. Tragedy and comedy at the same time. So against this kind of powerlessness, Against this kind of paralysis, Beckett employs a scene, Beckett employs an act, Beckett employs a dialogue, Beckett employs a situation which is at once tragic and farcical both. And the fact of the matter is that these tragic scenes or act or situations or dialogues create laughter. We laugh at the tragic and we weep at the farcical. 
So that is the thing in a Beckett play. So against this kind of powerlessness and paralysis, Beckett employs an act, a scene, a dialogue, a situation that, as, that at once tragically and farcically at loggerheads with the immediate. It moves us to tears and it moves us to laughter. Yet, and I conclude my lecture here at this juncture, that we laugh at the most tragic in Beckett and we weep at the most farcical in Beckett. So it moves to tears and laughter and yet compassion persists through the nightmares of negation and absurdism. So I stop this discussion on Samuel Beckett as a dramatist here. I also request you to go into um, some good resource and look at Beckett's life, his personal details, uh, his uh, literary career, his creative career. Right. In my next lecture, I'll be presenting a brief introduction of our play, Waiting for Godot. So that's all for today. Thank you very much.